Welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Wright Gallery Programming Series for our current show, In Touch, curated by Megan Young. Today, we are thrilled to present artist Rebecca Navasato. As a brief reminder, everyone tuning in today is in listen-only mode, so feel free to utilize that chat function and ask questions. We'll be sure to get to them at the end of the talk. Also, please keep in mind that because we're presenting from separate locations, there may be some variation of bandwidth, so if, if one of us freezes up or the sound fluctuates, thanks in advance for bearing with us. All right, thank you everyone and welcome Rebecca. Thanks Kat, uh, thank you for your support for um, this uh, putting together this uh, program and helping me out with it. Thanks Megan for including me with the uh, In Touch exhibition. It's been a really meaningful and special experience to have met all the artists uh, from around Ohio in this really meaningful way. So um, I really appreciate that. And uh, yes, yeah, Kat said, my name is Rebecca Navasoto. And um, today I'm just going to be sharing a little bit about my artist practice and using kind of an arc of a timeline to uh, share what's led me to these works that are at the Reif Gallery, but also what I'm currently working on and where I'm moving towards. And um, so I'll just start right here. Oh, there we go. Um, I, um, was born in Chicago, Illinois, and I was a child of Mexican immigrants. Um, this is my mom and dad and my siblings here. We moved to Cincinnati in the eighties. And, um, basically there wasn't really that big of a, an immigrant community here at that time. It was, um, uh, very insular to us, um, our kind of traditional Mexican household in, in Cincinnati and, Colrain actually at the, in this picture. And um, we did though connect, um, well, this is me in Chicago. So this will play in later. You could see me here um, hitting a piñata uh, and you can see the, the children in the background and the families we were all surrounded with were, um, you know, part of this robust immigrant community that had been established itself for, for many, many uh, decades in Chicago in particular. Um, and so um, we, my mother probably made that piñata as we did growing up um, for different celebrations, though on the weekends we would, uh, in Cincinnati, congregate with the immigrants that were in all the different neighborhoods to uh, a Catholic um, community, Spanish speaking, um, and usually the people that were there in that community were really, really recent immigrants who um, came from Guatemala, Central America, from Mexico, uh, and other places. And that was kind of our connection point. And we would make these, you'll see also why this is important later, these alfombra paintings on the ground with basically colored wood shavings and these particular designs. And they were, you know, filled with uh, Catholic and Christian iconography, as you can see. On the left here, uh, this is the large communal pieces that can be seen that are made in uh, parts of all over Mexico, really robustly, though, in southern Mexico and in Central America and Guatemala, particularly. And this is the influence, um, actually, of an indigenous practice that was later uh, co-opted by Catholic and Christian missionaries. Um, and so... Here, um, I'm showing an example of a couple of influences when I ended up going to um, art school. You know, it, it was sort of a uh, circuitous route. Um, I really started in business, a business at Xavier University, and it was not really working out. And I had this sort of coming uh, to Jesus moment, as my friend Anissa would say. And um, and, you know, I, I really had to take the plunge because I had to be on the trajectory. I, I had a, uh, a job uh, at Xavier Sign Crew um, that actually um, taught me how, basically we had to paint handmade signs for clubs and organizations from the university. And I was with all art majors there and just listening to them and what they're studying and what they're doing. I just couldn't take the fact that there were people in the world that were getting to study art and I wasn't one of them. And so... Um, so I, I, you know, with the encouragement of my mother and particularly uh, particular, I, I forged ahead and I studied with on the left here, we see a work from Frank Herman um, and on the right, uh, John Walker, his hero. And so uh, I really fell in love with the painting process, with the language of abstraction. It just really spoke to me. And, and these two artists 
uh, you know, uh, Frank and John, I ended up studying with John, his hero at Boston University, which I'm actually going to back up because this is very funny. This sweatshirt here says Boston University on it that we picked up at a thrift store and I ended up going there for graduate school. Uh, but I was noticing that they were very much inspired by uh, indigenous cultures. And, you know, they weren't even connected to them um, in their own genetic lineage. You know, they weren't that there wasn't that tie, but I could see that there was this kind of aching, this kind of searching and seeking for a connection to the archaic, you know? And um, so that was really interesting to me. Um, yeah, I'll talk more about that later. And so I was able to, you know, I graduated from BU or from UC DAP uh, and I was able to us have a conversation with the visiting artist John Walker, who was again Frank's uh, kind of uh, kind of hero, and you know was sort of this person leading the way in these beautiful kind of abstract paintings. And he had a, a program at BU for painting, and uh, in the in the ma a master's program. And so he came, he gave a talk. I I fell in love with the poetry of it and the landscape and. You know, I'll go back a little bit, just the uh, poetry of what this language meant, uh, the material, what the material meant. Um, it just felt right. You know, I didn't understand it all, but I knew this was something I wanted to pursue. And so uh, when I met with when I met with John, he came to my studio. We got to sign up to talk with him. He uh, invited me to to apply at Boston University. And while I was there, um, I took advantage of the opportunity to um, take a glyphic writing class, independent study at the P uh, at Harvard, because that was sort of a hub for Mesoamerican studies. It's right across the river. Um, and I'll back up a little bit because in my senior year of undergrad at DAP, very important moment because I, don't, I did meet John, but I also got to take a pre-Columbian art history class with Joe Face, who's a professor at DAP at the time. And it just blew my whole world open because I had been studying art history, you know, um, and um, I had understood the Western European canon and, you know, contemporary art, but this was like a whole other world, a, a whole other history of art where actually art was central to a whole civilization, you know, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, um, right here on this continent. And, and, and it was tied to my own uh, lineage as a, you know, Mexican blood, fully blood person, you know. Um, and so I noticed when I was like studying the glyphic, the glyphic, the glyphs, the Maya glyphs, um, that here's a syllabary on the right. Um, and so, they connected a consonant and a vowel to make their sound. So it was a phonetic, uh, but also logosyllabalic uh, language. And I noticed that the, the, the glyphs and the language of all Mesoamerica seemed to also have this unique process of abstraction, uh, distillation process from the man-made and natural world down to the most salient points. And so this really paralleled, you know, uh, other Western European abstract styles, you know, and yet I felt this was a more meaningful connection to me. Uh, this is a painting I did in graduate school. Again, I went, started at Xavier and transferred to DAP, completely terrified, you know, to do this. And I graduated from DAP, went to BU for painting and here I had all these cutouts, uh, all these printed blown up images of glyphs and contemplating them and curious about who the artist was in this ancient world, you know, and also how do they exist today? Like we have all this evidence, it still continues this kind of um, image making. And uh, although, you know, as we all know, the uh, indigenous cultures uh, all over the world, specifically in Mexico, were stamped out, vilified, suppressed, you know, completely marginalized now, maybe fetishized. Um, and I was 
I had these green overalls. If you can see here, these were actually like overalls that I had. And I had these, this dried fish on my lap and a horseshoe crab on my other lap. And on the floor of my studio, I had these um, glyphs, these, this language, this ancient abstracted language that was there. Just, this is me in the studio thinking about um, all of these things. So, um, oh, oh, that book, back, I'll back up a little bit. This book, as you can see, has been in my studio quite a bit because it's just always like a companion there, you know? And, um, but this is the in part of like the interior part, a page that I thought was interesting. Again, I was always curious here on the top right, how, uh, who was the scribe? The scribe was the artist in this ancient civilization and writing and painting were synonymous. They were one and the same. And um, so I was just very curious just how they came to these little salient images and then combine them together to create words and uh, meanings. Um, and a lot of this side note, a lot of this language was actually deciphered and it was it was really the Maya code was broken in in the mid seventies, so it's relatively new. And this woman from UC DAP, um, Linda Sheely, who was an art uh, an art professor and went into education as a practicality, but took her graduate students on a trip to Mexico and came upon these ruins that. Um, piqued her interest and it led to a lifelong investigation and research. She became pinnacle in breaking the Maya code and she's written all these books. It's really incredible. So it felt very um, kind of divine that I was in that space where she had been and um, in Cincinnati, you know, and then Mexico, this whole connection. Um, and so um, I started playing with these glyphs, you know, and here the scribe, this is an eight, yeah, eight foot by eight foot painting I did in graduate school. Um, I kind of wanted to have this sort of stone feeling, but this was my way of trying to connect with that, um, that uh, ancient artist, you know, um, and, you know, feeling this um, connection to uh, the poetic and creative world that they lived in, uh, you know, and supported by the art of my professors who were, you know, also uh, really engaged in that um, dialogue. And um, here I had these, uh, the dried fish was a deep symbol for me. Um, I had dried fish from the Boston market and I literally put it up on the canvas and traced it here. I was interested in the symbol of the fish, you know, in various cultures and ideologies meaning, you know, the deepest part of our of our subconscious, also like Christian iconography and just um, a lot of dream imagery I've had about fish. And so I always enter that into, into the paintings at times, just to ask questions, really, um, asking, who are you? What, why are you here? But what I found was interesting about, what I found interesting about the Maya scribe in particular was that they... It was, they were females and males, you know, they, they, they painted, there was a um, script that said that they painted their world into being, into being. Um, and, and that, did, again, it was a question mark, but I painted it and I thought that was fascinating. Um, this is a big fishtail here uh, that I sort of abstracted, almost feeling this movement going through the painting. Um, and uh, so this is literally like uh, an image of the Maya scribe that I've sort of manipulated and kind of merged into a fish head. And and again, thinking they're painting their world, they're painting their world. And um, there's a little glyph here peeking out um, that was a symbol den denoting my, my name. So I had all these secret hidden little messages in this narrative of searching. Um, when I came back from the East Coast. I, I spent some time in Vermont, but then I came back to Cincinnati, you know, really um, kind of closely tied with family here. Uh, my, you know, kind of nuclear family was still here. And a priest from the Catholic community, uh, Padre Jorge, I remember, uh, he asked me to do an installation for 
the Latino festival. And I thought, you know, I always love these wood shavings. They just mesmerized me, burned into my brain as a kid and growing up. And so I thought, what if I, what if I, as I researched the, this process, it predated Christian influences. And I thought, what if I reintroduce those indigenous motifs? This is the Quetzalcoatl that many of you might know, um, image who famously came um, to uh, visit the indigenous people. And people say that, oh, the Europeans were, you know, Hernán Cortés in particular was, was uh, mistaken for Quetzalcoatl in human form. Um, but I was really just playing and really trying to um, understand these processes and materials pre, uh, pre-Catholic intervention and Christian intervention. Um, and so here, um, I took some trips to Mexico to, you know, on a research grant um, right out of uh, undergrad. And I went back again after grad school um, and I started just to think about poetry that I was inspired by there in Boston and combining material and finding new ways to put it together. This is actually directly onto a wall with a uh, silicon. It was, took a lot to take off and reestablish that wall. And this was at a local place here in Cincinnati, um, Semantics Gallery. Here's another piece. Um, I was thinking about relationships and unity, um, some sort of personal iconography here. Um, I did this piece uh, in 2011 um, and I was living with somebody who had bees. It was I had roommates, you know, lots of roommates always. And uh, I had a roommate who was keeping bees and I was just thinking of that, that, that humming, that buzzing, you know, and this idea of working hard and, you know, worker bee virtues, you know, and how um, we just sort of go along and do the work of survival, you know, and I was thinking about that as an artist and, um, and how to, you know, it's really takes kind of courage to pursue this route um, and to commit to really in my, in my way, engaging with an unseen world, you know, and, um, and so um, these, these are sort of what I was thinking about at the time, the worker be virtues, you know, um, kind of trying to exist as an artist in a capitalist structure, basically. Um, and, um, you know, I was inspired, some of these are really kind of quick, quick um, sketches, and they sort of come to me, and I'm not quite sure why I need to do them. But um, I really have always had these dreams of, of um, I, I really reference dreams a lot when I'm coming up with imagery, especially if I have a repeated dream. And um, here I had, um, you know, been having dreams about uh, babies for, I swear, like decades, you know, and um, so I did this painting um, of these two babies that just I kept seeing in dreams and drawing and sketchbooks. I've always kept a big sketchbook practice since undergrad and um, it's interesting because I have two children now years later that look like these babies one's like smaller and dark and one is larger and like lighter skin um I did this piece here now I'm thinking about these um glyphs um feeling really kind of lost at this time actually and this was sort of a piece like called that I called like an SOS and I put the cardinal directions of where I was uh, this is at the Art Academy of Cincinnati it was a faculty show and I put the cardinal directions of where I was in this particular space from these ancient glyphs and sort of calling in help you know uh, so this was a form of therapy for me um, to just kind of you know invoke some assistance from uh, you know from ancestors from uh, that creative uh, power that uh, came from another time in particular, you know, that, um, you know, it, it really was just sort of an SOS the way that I saw it. And so here we have, um, you know, these different uh, symbols here that mean ancestors and um, a numerical um, images, images here. And you can see it here from another perspective. Um, but I really fell in love with the texture and the color. I found that that this was a way that I could paint. 
that was tied to my lineage. And um, it really also helped me to define uh, forms because you can't really paint. I feel like you can push around quite a bit and it can go on forever in many ways, you know, but here I was able to have a more direct communication with the painting on the floor and with this texture and, and material. Um, and um, these are a couple of pieces I'm gonna show that I did uh, while I was um, a, a new mother really. And um, we have uh, just sort of an internal state of being, this is paper and painting and pigment, um, you know, just thinking about um, intensity and transformation in this piece. Um, and pregnancy. Um, um, this piece I made, it's also mixed media, paper and pigment and cutouts, uh, spray paint. Um, and this is interesting because when I made this piece, I was thinking, I actually have this number very hidden, but it says 2020. I was just thinking about um, the year to come. And I was thinking about um, now that I was at an in intersection when I had my youngest daughter was starting preschool in the fall of 2019. And I had to kind of make a decision of, you know, I was trying to figure out what was going to be my path forward. You know, at this point, I hadn't really been robustly in the studio. I was sketching all the time. I was writing in my sketchbook, you know, and doing some pieces, but not really putting myself out there. Um, I was really dedicating myself to being, you know, uh, you know, a mother to very small children at that time. And so I, I saw the snake of the mouth, the mouth of a snake that I had been looking at, um, at the Maya, like at the Maya exhibit, actually at, the, at Cincinnati museum center. Um, but I had also been interested in that motif, which meant, um, the symbol of the snake meant death rebirth or death transformation and rebirth um and so i also think it kind of looks like a coronavirus when i look at it now um and so in 2021 i was awarded a truth and reconciliation grant by artsway for black and brown artists and you know i started to really uh dig into this um idea of mesoamerican uh, mysticism and practices. Um, and this one, this piece, uh, Coatl, and um, this is the Edge exhibit, but this particular piece is called Coatl and Conjuring Hands. And so again, the snake motif came um, in response to, I was thinking about the murder of George Floyd in particular during the pandemic and how um, art could be used to um, to basically bring about and help usher in change. Um, and it could be done in this very even open language because uh, the idea of objects as ritual uh, were was really interesting to me in Mesoamerica. And I thought, could I still do that now? I actually, in this moment, started to think, this isn't an artifact, you know, of the past these uh, ways of operating as an artist in the world, um, maybe it could be a path forward. And um, so I, we went through a really deep healing, personal healing period at this time from 2018 to 2021 and still on it. But I really started to write a lot. I started to think about these indigenous practices as a way to heal and it really just another really big opening in my world. Um, a big moment of trans transformation was happening personally. And so I thought, you know, I think we need to help kill off this old world, you know, and um, as we're doing that, and so the snake is ushering in a death, you know, we, and especially after, you know, I was thinking of George Floyd, particularly that this is a time that, the old world paradigm must come to an end and um, we're ready for a transformation and a rebirth. Um, inside the snake here, we see the motif of the ancestors. Um, 
it's like this two-headed shape here. It's a glyph that means ancestors. And so I thought that while this world is going through this really tough moment of just, you know, death of an old world, the transformation that we're heading and we're building a new world um, that our ancestors can be by our side, supporting us and um, kind of uh, giving us guidance if we, if we ask for that. And that is a huge belief in indigenous Mesoamerica. Um, and one that I've really adopted, you know, I, I, I came from, you know, I, I really kind of was playing with this whole idea of, of Mesoamerican interested in it, but I never really put it into practice in my real life. I really was, you know, somebody who bought into, you know, the age of enlightenment and rational um, thought will deliver everything for us, you know, and yet um, when in my own personal life, that trajectory hadn't worked, I started to turn to to these uh, kind of spiritual practices and engagement with that unseen world. And um, and so I knew that if, uh, as this world was destro getting destructed, you know, or we're leaving the old world, um, that yes, we can call on our ancestors, but we also have to envision the future world. And so I have a series of these hands here throughout this sort of sea surrounding the snake, wielding a writing stylus or pencil or pen, maybe it's a wand. And knowing that as we're, you know, trans in the state of transformation of death transformation, that we can create our new world through our imagination um, as written and painted or seen through art. Um, so we can write our own story moving forward. So this is an aerial view of that. It's about six feet wide, maybe a little big and 20 feet wide, um, long length, I mean. Okay, and so here we have the pieces, the uh, two of the uh, the pieces that are in the Rife Gallery right now. And so this top panel uh, means, it, I titled this piece to write, to conjure the top clearly states like that, you know, there's a, there's a stylus again, or a writing tool. Maybe it's a paintbrush or a wand, you know, I like to keep that open. But basically, what it means in its essence is that in that world of imagination, which I started to think a lot about, we can transfer that uh, imagination for a future desired reality, and deposit it into this world um, for to evoke change, you know, through art, through writing. Um, the perimeter of that top piece is a glyph that means human, uh, winique or human. Um, and then the bottom piece here is a glyph that I, uh, this I kind of made up my own. And then this one I've altered a little bit, but comes from a source of inspiration that means to conjure, to conjure. And so really, again, this is sort of a ritual object that um, brings about a, almost like um, a talisman of some kind, you know, it's a reminder, it's a ritual object. Um, and it's really personal, but it's also something that I hope inspires others to know that, you know, they can do the same. And here we have um, an installation of to right to conjure on the left and the right side. This was at the Freedom Center. The, um, and here in Cincinnati, and I installed it along with these paper hands right in the center. Um, the paper hands are done in that piñata style. Again, kind of, uh, I wanted to, you know, use some more materials that I had done as in my childhood. Also learning that piñatas um, came in with a European influence, but actually there was this paper making tradition in, in the indigenous world as well. And so, um, I started to do these abstracted hands as a symbol of a collective humanity here. Now projected onto them is um, this flame that kind of builds and then dies down. And this was inspired by the new fire ceremony that is an ancient um, practice in Mesoamerica that still exists today, which was tied to the Aztec calendar round. And it basically marked the end of one cycle and the beginning of a new one. And they had this idea that 
you know, we had to symbolically burn away um, elements symbolically to of the old cycle in order to move into the into the future cycle of our world. So again, reinforcing this uh, this idea of uh, death, transformation, and rebirth, and kind of my idea was this is ushering it in. This was happening, and I was helping it through this this work here. Um, okay. And here's another view of that from the side, just looking at the texture. Um, I think these are pieces that really can be appreciated in person. Um, another view here from the floor looking up. Okay. Um, I was really fortunate to have received that grant for 2021, 2022, and 2023. Um, I, um, I'll just um, show you here. I got to take a trip in 2022 with my family uh, with the support of this Arts Wave grant to go to this town of Cuentepec in, um, um, let's see where, this was about 30 miles from where my grandmother lives right now in near the town of Sochi, Calco. And um, it's about, it's over 2000 years old there. Um, the descendants of Sochi Calco live in nearby Cuentepec um, and they speak Nahuatl, which is the uh, official language of that town, which is very rare in Mexico. Um, it's important to note that there is 68 indigenous languages being spoken in Mexico, just in Mexico today. Um, and so, I was interested to kind of dig deeper into the glyphic writing systems and just see how, you know, language and art might still be alive. It's still alive. It, it definitely is. It's fact, it's thriving in complexity. Um, you know, I think uh, we see that, you know, the genocide here of indigenous people in the United States happened much more effectively in a way than in Mexico. We still see it uh, existing and thriving and, um, and there is an identity crisis, I believe, happening, you know, with the people who um, were kind of by design told to deny their indigenous heritage. But um, let's move. I'm going to show you really quickly um, this indigenous town. Yeah, the descendants live here in Guantepec. Um, I, I actually took a solo trip to Mexico the fall before coming here in the spring with my my uh, family. And I was able to um, see an exhibit of art in the Museo Populares there. Actually, this is a little image of it here in um, in in, um, in Mexico City in Coyoacan. And I was just fascinated. I'm like, this is a whole show of indigenous art. And when I looked, it was in the town really close to where my I was going to be going the next day to visit my my grandmother and other family. And so um, I was able to actually go to that town and find the, the, the scholar who had written, done a lot of writing for that show. And I got to meet with some of the artists who were in the show. Um, a lo lot of these women carrying on this tradition of mud works, um, you know, for thousands of years. They had uh, even taken you know, that when immigrants, when they left to go to the States seeking work, you know, in the, um, uh, in the 1900s, in the early 1900s, and they'd bring back these radios and um, they would recreate them in their mud forms. And I thought that was really interesting that, that they were taking an old, a new technology and recreating it in an old sort of technology. And uh, and then I started to think about the symbol of the the radio, right? And um, let's see here. And so the scholar that I talked to, Victorino, um, actually we share a last name, Nava, um, Torres Nava. And um, he is begin he started an indigenous collective space in Guantepec to kind of uh, have a haven of um, protection for language, for art, um, for ritual. And um, basically the language is where the indigenous world lives. It exists and must flourish. 
uh, if, if that's stamped out, basically, you know, the that world will die. And so um, it's interesting. I was talking to these ladies here and when they were shown at this museum, at this gallery, the younger girls in this family, cousins and friends, even in the community, were just, their eyes got really big. They were like, wow, you know, because a lot of the danger here is that, you know, people are pulled to modernity to, you know, to give up these old ways. But I'm happy to see that there has been this, again, archaic re revival, this interest in indigenous cultures, specifically, you know, how that affects the younger generations and these communities to see that, that there is value here, you know, um, that is recognized by the outside world. And so I was, uh, this is a, an artist here who was, uh, you can see the radio um, that she's, she showed me how she was, uh, she did the whole process of creating these pieces. Um, and so I created these radios out of Biñatas thinking about that and, you know, transferring them into this material um, and thinking about how the radio is a transmitter of a language of ideas um, that can perpetuate ideas of equity and inequity and, um, and so um, I started thinking more broadly about future technologies, you know, how can we um, use these technologies to, um, to support this archaic revival, just sort of this idea of collapsing time and sort of reinfor uh, reinforcing one another. Um, and so this piece down here on the floor is part of that series as well called Tepotzanili. Tepotzanili means radio recorder in, um, in Nahuatl in the language of Nahuatl. And so um, <clears throat> here I had in the middle these, and this is my children and me. Um, uh, look, it just gives you a little bit of idea of scale here. Um, and then I'll show you here. We've got these hands. Um, I'll go back a little bit. There's the perimeter here that I used was, was taken from the Ohio River between Covington and Cincinnati. I kind of use that as um, kind of a structure right down the center. And then I had these um, images of um, these brown hands holding a iPhone basically. But inside the iPhone, we have these like um, abstracted sections of the monarch butterfly. And the monarch butterfly um, basically I was thinking of that connection that I have with Mexico being here in the Midwest in this specific place, you know, and, you know, a lot of the technology I'm using to reconnect with, um, you know, uh, these communities and um, learning about the history, learning about uh, regeneration efforts that are happening right now is used through technology, you know, and so um, the inextricable link between nature and humans is something that is just integral to to indigenous um, worldviews and so i was thinking about how the monarch butterfly monarch butterfly uses um, rivers systems to help track their path passage from the midwest to mexico every year and back um, if you look at the um, you know the history of or the history the um you know, that unique um, trajectory of the monarch but butterfly. Um, I also have triangles here that are from the uh, quilt code. Some people believe it's real or some people believe it's mythical um, from the Underground National Railroad. This particular triangular configuration is uh, says to follow the wild geese home to uh, follow the wild geese north to freedom. And um, this tied into a poem that's been close to my heart, Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. Um, and so here I put in images at the end of that Depotzanili, this one's called live stream transmission, the AI symbol here. This is a corporate logo that, that means AI. And so I was kind of mixing in contemporary logos but I was infusing them surrounded by these little flowers, which mean poetry and art in the Nahuatl language. And so I was thinking of, you know, infusing 
as a ritual kind of as almost like a spell, you know, to infuse our technology with a way to perpetuate um, art, poetry, and uh, support and regeneration of these communities. Um, so I offered any sale of any sale from that series went to uh, a, por a big portion went to support Chinanchkalco, which is that collective indigenous space. And um, here's a little bit about the material, um, basically wood shavings from various different uh, wood shops around town, um, and then um, you know pigmented with powder pigment or um, mist tints, you know, um, house paint sometimes. Um, and then this is that floor piece is actually cut into four is in four sections. It's a permanent piece with an ephemeral edge. And I used a wallpaper paste, um, many different experiments until I found that material that bound the wood shavings to the material. And um, you can see it here being pulled apart uh, at the Cincinnati Art Museum, where it traveled to um, in 2023, um, I did a series called Laqua Patia, which means to eat, to heal. And this series um, was dedicated to indigenous healers around uh, in Mesoamerica. And this is a poem by Maria Sabina, which is an, a famous indigenous Mazatecan healer from Mexico. Um, and it's called Heal Yourself. Um, and so you can see these panels on the side here are mycelium networks. Um, I had an interactive piece here, um, the healing table, where I invited people to a personal practice that I've done. You know, this was kind of breaking out of my comfort zone, but I, I was inviting people to join in a ritual, you know, that has helped me where I write. And um, this is inspired by that like Lili Wea um, healing process where you put corn or even wood shavings, believe it or not, onto a body uh, through prayer as a way to ac extract an ailment or some kind of suffering internally. Um, and so it kind of built up um, the last 2021 through 2023 series got showcased at the Western Art Gallery this past fall. And I brought back the healing table here. Um, this was at the Welcome Project at Wave Pool um, Contemporary Art Center here in Cincinnati. Shout out to the Welcome Project and Wave Pool. Um, they um, hosted me uh, as an artist um, in residence this past spring. And so it fills up. I had this image there of all of the ancestors coming to join you at the table as you made these petitions, you know, for healing. And then ritualistically uh, later, these are destroyed in my studio. Here we see a little video of, uh, that's my daughter eating pomegranates, but I'm taking the contents of the healing table. And, um, you yeah, know, this is kind of personal, but I, I did a video because I wanted to show people, hey, this is what we do. And then I use copal smoke it's a resin from the Seba tree, which is a very holy tree in um, ancient ancient Mexico, used today as what well, used today also um, to help usher those prayers um, into into the ether. And so it was a great responsibility, but I felt you know I was just sort of a conduit there. And um, okay, my son helping out make the fire. And um, yeah, oops, um, this is a work in that same show um, inspired by breaking the chains of generational trauma. This is sort of a double helix and it went through the perimeter of that show. So you can see really long, these are, these installations are really challenging to photograph, uh, but um, this whole show was inspired again by healing about personal uh, reconnection to healing practices. And um, again, this is the mycelial network that's um, in these large panels um, in a mirrored shape to kind of show this um, praying mantis image. 
um, and you can see the mantis image here, it, it is found in, in pottery in El Salvador and also in ancient Greece. And it means the seer. And um, I've been interested in that symbol because Maria Sabina, this is her pictured here, who the show was dedicated to and to all indigenous healers, went into these realms. And um, it's, it's a very interesting, you know, she was a mushroom healer um, in um, uh, Huatulco, uh, in Oaxaca, in the highlands, uh, in the mountains. I might be pronouncing that wrong. I sometimes confuse the names, but um, she um, was, you know, and we're seeing this, we're seeing this third wave happening now of, of these um, psychedelic me medicines coming into our contemporary world and being, you know, um, backed up by science. And so uh, you're seeing this kind of acceptance of really what, what our indigenous healing practices. And um, so I, in that show, invited people to, to um, donate to the Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund. So as these decisions are being made, um, as these medicines are being now introduced um, to the world um, legally and, you know, who's in charge of making those decisions. And so the Indigenous Medicine Conservation Fund um, brings uh, Indigenous leaders to the to the table to make to be part of these decision making processes and here's those panels again um shooting up kind of this idea of people could see each other through the through these panels um and again this network of uh community and unity that can happen uh, i was thinking about um mutual aid that happens underground in these you know, these um, mycelial networks and how like um, are all of our indigenous ancestors, you know, it's not just Mesoamerica, Europeans have indigenous heritage um, that we can um, learn from, from the natural world and how to operate in the world. Okay, and so, and this is the final piece, which is, um, I just did this one, finished this one in January of this year. And I'm going back to this idea of the ritual object and sort of stretching text now. And um, I brought back the triangles from the um, Mary Oliver poem of the wild geese, but also that triangular configuration, meaning wild geese, follow the wild geese north to freedom that came from the underground railroad, quilt codes, mythological or true, they now live in our imagination collectively, but also this idea of uh, I put last and first and stretched out the language and sort of this idea of rebalancing, you know, our history collectively as a specifically in the United States, you know, um, I think about when we heal individually, we have to go back into our history and reconcile, you know, painful memories and family traumas, uh, whether they be inherited or in your family, you know, um, we do that, we have to do that societally in communities and in the United States in particular, you know, we can't forge ahead to see a future, I feel, without reconciling how we began as a country. And part of that is to recognize these difficult truths about you know, um, slavery and also um, indigenous genocide and, and those kinds of issues. And how can we propel ourselves forward and reconcile those realities? And I think that there's a way, you know, I'm thinking about that through art and encourage others to do the same. Um, and then finally, if you want to follow me, uh, this is my Instagram link. And I usually post you know, what's going on in the studio or what's upcoming or podcasts that I've been on or um, just things, I'm um, projects that I'm going to be a part of. Um, also calls to the studio is for sometimes for those large pieces, I'll invite people to come and join to uh, continue in that communal building of these pieces. Um, so I invite you to check me out and follow me. Um, you can feel free to email me as well. And it's Rebecca Nava, Rebecca Navasoto and, and all of the different um, social media outlets. So hope to hear from you.
That was wonderful. Thank you, Rebecca. Folks, if you have questions, please pop that into the chat and we will bring those up. I do have a couple already. Okay. Um, let's start with um, how do you start a new piece? You mentioned that you have a ske sketchbook. Um, yeah. Do you finish work started as sketches or how, how does that iterative process work for you? Um, sometimes, well, I'm always sketching and writing ideas um, daily or um, I have Google Docs as well where I collect images, you know, when I just have my phone on me in bed or something I'll you know, I always encourage people to when an idea comes, you have to have something to put it down or else it might just float away. And, um, you know, some of them are very direct, you know, like to conjure, to write came very like directly from a drawing, just some, you know, adjustments and so on. And some are layered and they take forever and I don't know what they want to be. They'll sit there and they'll I'll work on them in the studio. And then it's a conversation. It's a dialogue that um, you hear. I've learned to foster that inner quiet voice um, in in the studio. So you'll you'll know yes or no, you know. And um, and sometimes it's frustrating. You walk away, you come back. So it's a conversation, I believe, with an unseen self-generating element. And so you just have to kind of be in line with that. And when you're not, you walk away, you come back. And sometimes it takes a very long time. And sometimes it's more direct, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so you use wood shavings quite a bit. Are there particular kinds of wood shavings that you find um, are best to work with or that you prefer for different aspects of your work? Yeah, um, the really fine material has been my favorite recently because you can manipulate that. In that last piece, I was able to make really thin pieces and then the thicker ones are great for the floor, you know, the thicker shavings to make that textural um, movement. Um, so I'm playing with the different material and how I like the a range for different reasons. Yeah. And different uh, shapes. Yeah. So sourcing that from a community of, of wood shops means that you're building community too there. So can you talk a little bit about how that has come to be? Sure. I mean, I find that people really want to help artists. Um, uh, Mr. Sheely from uh, a local lumber yard here who's had a lumber yard for generations, um, you know, <laughs> gave me a bunch of wood shavings one time. I said, can I have some wood shavings? And he opened up this big uh, uh, chute and gave me like, it. it was like, 10 feet high and it was like massive and I was there like just shoveling for hours with my little daughter I'm like what did I well I asked for this you know he had massive amounts and then you know um Dan Levy at Art Academy at the wood at the wood shop there so kind so sweet um we'll save some and so you know people will save some for me here and there and then at the wave pool you know Scotty Bellissimo also has helped me out with wood shaving so you know sometimes I'll get an email now or you know, we'll say, hey, I've got some wood shavings. Do you want? So sometimes I do. And sometimes I'm like at capacity. Uh, but yeah, I have a whole system now in the studio, different colors and uh, different textures. Yeah. But it's wonderful to to use that kind of material that um, is usually cast off from other projects um, or, you know, it does go to livestock and, and things like that. But that feels really good to to use that. The, the original material for those floor pieces were actually um, dried seeds and flowers and natural materials um, in, you know, the ancient world. And then, you know, as the industrial revolution made its way to Mexico, it there was a lot of wood shavings. And so that changed into, into wood shavings. And so I'm open to what that material will evolve to as well. I've used pine needles as well in uh, in some of the installations, which I don't think I talked about, but um, I'm open to, you know, how it'll change again. But right now I'm having fun with with this material. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Um, so clearly, you know, you're referencing uh, the glyphs and all that kind of good stuff. You're clearly using uh, hands quite a lot. Can you elaborate on the importance of using hands as a symbol in your work? Yeah, actually, there are 
Mesoamerican hands all throughout art, the, the Mesoamerican ancient art world. Um, there's um, hands that signify, I really felt connected to it because in my search for, you know, I didn't get a chance to grow up in these communities, you know, um, and I wanted to connect with that community and in that ancient vein, like that trajectory. And when I saw those hands in the glyphic writing, um, and you can look it up, just look up Maya hands, you know, or Mesoamerican hands there, just everywhere in the the glyphs and the carvings, but it was just seeing, you know, the hands that, you know, and you think of the earliest paintings too, um, they have the hands, you know, it really is a very direct way to feel that humanity creating and touching and um, engaging with their world. And in that way, I felt that closeness. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll be a motif that continues throughout. Yeah, for me. Thank you for that. Um, and I often, I like to close out with a question about um, how we give it forward. Um, meaning if you can take a lesson that you learned in your journey as an artist to where you are now, um, what would you hand to those that are starting the journey? Um, yeah, I think, um, I think it's, it's, it's never been a better time to be a, a young artist coming up in the world there. There's not the gatekeepers that were there once, but really I'll go back to the idea that it takes courage to, um, to make a commitment, you know, to this creative practice that um, is really a, uh, abundant and part of our nature. And we all had it as children, you know, and um, you know, the systems that at play in our society will sort of pull us away from that. And so it takes courage to continue to um, uh, foster that and protect that and to uh, hold on to your creative spirit despite any outside influences, you know. And, and this is the place where, you know, I talk about the imagination a lot because if you're able to hold in your imagination a vision, you know, of abundance in your work and um, in your life, that is extraordinary to, um, so I, I um, you know, I think that people don't talk enough about doubt, you know, when you're in that creative practice in that world. And so, um, you know, I would go head first into that doubt and investigate that and, it's, you know, we're in this great time where we're able to connect with communities for artists online, even, you know, that maybe not even in your, uh, in your immediate, uh, you know, environments, but you can reach out and find support to, you know, find others who are um, uh, finding a way to have a robust practice to deal with, you know, doubt and to uh, strengthen your belief systems, you know. Um, so I, I would encourage you to reach out to communities, um, to reach out to healing communities, uh, art communities, healing communities. And, um, and that doesn't have to necessarily be local either. So um, that would be my, um, yeah, my biggest suggestion. Um, Perfect. I think one Thank of them, I probably could offer a lot more, but for now, oh, that'll be it. <laughs> that's perfect. Thank you again, Rebecca, so much for the generosity of your time and talent. Um, thank you all for joining us for this artist talk by Rebecca Nava Soto as a part of our programming for In Touch. I'd like to give a special thank you to the curator, Megan Young. A big thank you to all the participating artists, as well as the Ohio Arts Council's board, the Ohio legislature, and the governor who support the Ohio Arts Council this bright space, and of course, Ohio artists. Thanks everyone and have a great day.